you kind of expect to talk about the Christmas story and the Christmas passage. And I'm going to encourage you guys again one more time, and we're going to hear this all throughout this month, is invite somebody to come with you. People are more apt and more willing to go to church during Christmas season other than Easter morning any other time of the year. It's just they kind of expect it. It's like it's, even though we've made Christmas so much more than what it actually was, we, we've commercialized and all that kind of stuff. Deep down, especially in our culture, people know it's baby Jesus in the manger. And they're, listen, they're more open to coming. And this is something that not only is good for us to hear as a church, but this is a message of hope that our neighbors need to hear and our coworkers need to hear. And so, man, let's invite them to come in and be a part of this. And last week we looked over at the story of Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 and how God had been silent for 400 years and then he chose to bro- break that silence with Zechariah. And the takeaways we have from last week were that number one was a promise made by God as a promise kept. And the second thing was though it may seem God is silent, he's active. And the last thing from last week was that God's not mad at you He hasn't forgotten you, and he hasn't given up on you. And this week, we're going to dive into the story of Mary. And so we're almost in Luke chapter 2, what everybody's really familiar with, with the Christmas story. We're almost there. But this here builds up to that. But I promise you, more of you are probably more familiar with this part uh, than you were of last week's passage. But we're going to look at um, this story of Mary. And I hate using the word story because it kind of gives that connotation that it might not be real. So the passage, the the, the telling here of, of Mary, because this is the part that starts to captivate us. This is the part that, like, we can almost put ourselves in that situation and kind of start to somewhat relate to what's going on, like the emotions and what it must have been like to experience that, to go through that. Um, it grabs us. It really does. That's why this time of year, it's just something changes in our minds, doesn't it? Something changes in the way we act. We start becoming more aware of certain things. It's because this part of this story starts to grab us. And while we probably can't relate to giving birth to the Messiah and what that would have been like, uh, we can relate and associate with some of those raw emotions that must have come along with that. This turbulent and super exciting but also dangerous time. And uh, a number of years ago, I think Daniel, our son, was probably four. I don't remember. Jonathan was younger. They were younger. We took him down in Branson. There was this show, this theater called the Sight and Sound Theater. They have one in Pennsylvania. There's one in Branson. And they put on these, it's, it's owned by, it's a Christian organization. They put on these amazing productions of Bible passages. Like they did, they've done Samson. They did Jonah. They did Moses. They did one with Noah. Awesome. If you've never been, I encourage you to go. But this one year, the boys were really young, and we took uh, Jonathan and Daniel, and they were doing the Christmas story. And it was phenomenal. I mean, just to see it on stage was super cool. And it was, so, it was so engaging. It helps see it play out on stage, which you already know in the passage. It kind of helps it come to life for you. Um, and they took some liberties, but not with the scripture, but they kind of added some dramatic elements in it. And one element was this one part of the play, Mary has told Joseph that she's pregnant. And remember, they're engaged. They're not married. And so Joseph knows it's not his baby. And they're they're having this discussion, and Joseph's trying to figure out, what do I do with her? Do I divorce her? Um, do, I, do I put her away privately? He could even have her killed if he wanted to. So they're having this, this discussion, and Mary's crying in this thing, and you can see the room they're talking in on stage, and you see the street outside. And all the Pharisees and the priests start gathering in the street because the townspeople have heard that this Mary, this young girl who's not married, is pregnant. And they're angry. You can see the tension in them, like they're they're upset about this, and they're talking about arresting Mary. And they're talking about dragging her out of the city and either killing her or, or putting her away. And so, like, the tension is so thick in this auditorium, you can cut it with a knife. Because everybody's on the edge of their seat. They know Mary gives birth to Jesus, but they don't know how it's all going to play out on stage here. And so, this auditorium is dead silent. A thousand people watching this production on stage and they're all like on the edge of their seat, like it's so thick, and like everybody's engaged in this. But my son Daniel is for he's engaged in this. Like he's emotionally involved in this thing that's going on on stage, and everybody's quiet. And you see Mary and Joseph, they're getting ready to leave this room, and they're going to start walking down the stairs where all the Pharisees and the townspeople are that are angry. And in this dead silent moment, this awesome, like, Okay, what's going to happen, this climactic time? 
Daniel yells out at the top of his lungs, Hey! (laughs) Don't go down there! The bad men will get you! I mean, he is so engrossed in this. And of course, moment is over, right? People are laughing now. Like, it's like, I feel horrible. Manny and I are kind of like trying to grab his mouth, but we're too late. Like, we're trying to cover it, but it's already out there. We're trying to sink under the seats because everybody's like, we pay good money to see this. And some four-year-old is yelling at the characters on stage. But he was so involved, emotionally connected with what was happening that it bothered him. He's like, just couldn't help himself. He had to save their life. And I really think he probably believed it. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect these people. But, like, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about Mary's story. Have you ever really thought about what that meant for her? What that was going to cost her? What that must have been like? Like, of course, the excitement of being able to carry the Messiah and give birth to the Savior, but have you ever thought about what Mary must have thought right after that meeting with the angel that we're going to read about here in just a minute? Because, listen, the, the, the things that she must have been going through her mind, the fear, the danger, The worry, the possibility of rejection, not just by the townspeople, but by her own family. The the, the divorce, I mean, Joseph could have divorced her. Joseph could have put her to death. So the idea of, okay, I might die, like this is what's going on here. The threat of homelessness. Because at worst, at best, if Joseph just puts her away privately, she's a pregnant, unmarried girl in that culture whose family would probably kick her out. So where is she going to go? This loss of the love of her life, Joseph, who she's engaged to. I mean, this is, church, this is more than just words on a page that we're going to read this morning. This is real life. It's more than just a catchy story that we read once a year. This is real people in a real circumstance that happen. And sometimes we forget that as we just read the words on the page. That this is a real thing. And we're talking about a thrill of hope. this, This time, though, this thrill takes on a whole new meaning. Because this time, the thrill is behind each corner lies more danger, more uncertainty, more of the unknown. So in your Bibles, in Luke chapter 1, look in verse 26. We're picking up the story after we, where we left off last week with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And here's what we see. <clears throat> in the sixth month, now that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So Elizabeth is now pregnant for six months. So God spoke after 400 years, and now only six months has gone by, and God's going to speak again. It says, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, rejoice, favored woman, for the Lord is with you. She was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, how can this be? Since I have not been intimate with a man, and the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing shall be impossible with God. Mary's only answer in this, she says, I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. So who's this Mary? And who is she? Mary's just a teenage girl, to be honest with you. She's poor. She's a nobody. Um, She's from the lower working class in a little town called Nazareth. We'll look a little bit more of that here in just a moment. She's no younger than 12, but probably not much older than 16. Most historians and and scholars believe that she's probably around that 16, 15-ish range when this angel comes to her. And she's engaged to a young working man named Joseph. And they live in a town called Nazareth. And I want to kind of focus on that because this really, where she's from, tells a lot about her. This phrase you've heard in the Gospels, when sometimes they refer to Jesus, they called him Jesus of Nazareth. And the reason for that is it, it kind of emphasizes the humble background of who Jesus was. Because Nazareth was considered a lowly, despised town in Galilee. 
Um, we, we have, the way we have it set up here is we have a state. We live in the state of Ohio. Then you have a county that you live in. Then you live in a city in that county, right? Well, for them, Galilee, think of Galilee as their county. That's their region. And Nazareth is a city inside Galilee. And what we'll find is that of all the counties or regions of Israel, Galilee is the least. <laughs> it's the poorest of the counties. It's the one that's looked down on. Like if you're from Galilee, you're from the backwoods. And of the, all the cities in Galilee, Nazareth was the worst one you could be from. It was the poorest of the poor county. And so we're seeing kind of a parallel with Zechariah from last week, right? He was the nobody priest from the nobody group of priests. And so we've seen that repeat a little bit. Um, and we see that when Jesus meets Philip, when he's calling his disciples, and Philip goes to his brother Nathaniel and says, I found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. You know what Nathaniel says? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, that's, that's what Nazareth is, okay? That's the city that we're talking about here. But this, this lowly view of Nazareth fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. That Jesus would come from a lowly region that was despised, that was rejected, because he was going to be despised and rejected. The Old Testament prophecy specifically notes the idea of Jesus coming from a lowly area, and that was well understood. Now, I know he was born in Bethlehem, but he wasn't raised in Bethlehem, okay? He's from Nazareth. Nazareth, it was looked down upon the people of Galilee. Um, in fact, when you look at historians, when they write about Galilee, they never mention the city Nazareth until the 3rd century of this, 3rd uh, third, third century A.D. Like, it was that small. It was that unknown, and people didn't care about it, all right? Um, like, I'm, I'm from a small town called Port Natchez, Texas, right? Most people... 99.999% of the people have no idea where Port Natchez, Texas is. So when people ask me, hey, where are you from? I say Texas because <laughs> they know where Texas is at, right? They say, well, where at in Texas are you from? I'll usually throw out Houston, right? Because most people can get an idea of geog geographically speaking where Houston is in, is in Texas. And I'll say, fine, Houston, go an hour and a half east. If you hit Louisiana, you went too far, right? Um, if, and Manny and I, we moved from a small town called Clever, Missouri, and if somebody came and said, if you were to find somebody talking about the cities in southwest Missouri, they're not going to mention Clever. So it's a very small town. When we moved there. I think they might have had 600 people, maybe something like that, maybe, maybe 1,000. If you talk about towns in southwest Missouri, you're going to talk about Springfield and Branson, maybe Joplin if they kind of are a little more familiar with the area. That's how it was with, with Nazareth. It was just this nowhere hillbilly hick out in the sticks town in a nowhere hillbilly out in the sticks county, okay? And so, so much so they didn't even mention it. Most of the people who live in Nazareth, if not all of them, there were lower working class people. Some of them didn't even have houses. Most of them lived in caves in the area. They would just hollow out a cave, put some walls around it, and that was their home. It was that poor. And so, but what does that tell us about who God chooses to use to accomplish his purposes? What does that tell us about God? The setting of this story tells us that God looks for the meek and the humble. He's looking for people who are available, people to use for his great purposes. And he chooses the least likely to accomplish his most important work. He chose a slave people to be his chosen people. He chose the youngest of Jesse's sheep herding sons to be the greatest king of Israel. He chose the nobody priest from the nobody group of priests to break the silence after 400 years. And then he chooses this nobody girl from a nobody town to carry the Messiah as Paul says to the Christians in Corinth, he says, God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are. James says it this way, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God pushes away. He literally, proud people, God pushes, he resists them. But he speaks to, he engages with, he gives grace to those that are humble. And we see that played out with Mary. Location factors heavily into who she is. Um, if I told you, if I said, hey, look, um, imagine you're told about a group of people. One person uh, grew up in the Appalachian part of West Virginia. One person grew up in Manhattan, New York. One person grew up in Southeast Texas. One person grew up in Southern Alabama. One person grew up in the middle of nowhere, Montana. All right. If I, if I had this list of people and I gave that list to you, hey, this is where they're from. Humanly speaking, we make assumptions on who they are based on where they're from, don't we? It's just natural. We just do that. We, we just kind of assume the person from the inner, the big city, Manhattan, probably a little more educated. 
doesn't always pan out, but that's kind of what we think, right? That people from the sticks, from the middle of nowhere, they're probably a little more backwoods. They're probably a little more narrow-minded. We make assumptions about people based on where they're from, and that's not something that's new. That's the same thing that happened here. People judge based on whether they grew up in Judea, Samaria, or Galilee, whether they're from the city or whether they're from this rural area. So it's with Nazareth and Galilee. Galilee's remote. Nazareth is even more remote. And we look at this, we go, okay, why did God choose Nazareth when he could have chosen this town called Sephorus, which was in Galilee, about 16 miles away, had a lot of wealthy people who had a lot of resources, who had nice houses, who had, if you're going to bring in the Savior of the world, don't you want to put them in a position where, man, people can actually take care of them, not give them to a poor carpenter who's probably out of work, right? And, and with a young girl who doesn't have any money either, why wouldn't you pick Sephorus? But you're still in Galilee, why pick Nazareth? In the eyes of the more educated and urban Jews, the Nazarenes would have been judged as ignorant people and simple-minded sinners. So that's where Mary's from. So what about her? What are some takeaways today? I want to leave us with some very practical things from Mary's passage here. Not that we're elevating Mary. We're not deifying her. She's a sinner just like you and I. She's not perfect. We don't pray to her. But we can learn some things from why God chose Mary, that maybe there's some things lacking in our life. Maybe there's some things we're missing out on because maybe there's a little more pride and not enough humility in our life. Maybe there's some things we're looking at wrongly in our life that maybe from this passage we can apply today, that we can walk out of these doors and go, yeah, I'm going to put, God wants me to put this into my life today because he wants to use me. So the takeaways from today, number one, maybe you want to write these in the margins of Luke chapter 1 like you did last week with Zechariah, but the number one thing this morning is this. Our ordinary becomes extraordinary in God's story. Our ordinary becomes extraordinary in God's story. I mean, we're looking at Mary's background. During the time that Mary lived, most of this area was undergoing a serious economic recession. More than likely, it was like a depression. Herod the Great had these big building programs going on for a number of years. They were building stuff all over the land of Israel. But by this time, all that had stopped. And so all those tradesmen and all those carpenters and stonemasons were out of work. Well, what was, what was Joseph? He was a carpenter. Why was he not living in Bethlehem anymore where he was born? Why was he in Nazareth, which was about 70 miles away? Probably because that's the only place he could find enough work to eke out a living. It's like a day-to-day type grind to try to make a life for himself and for his future bride. And so this is, this is the time this, that Mary is living and the time that Jesus is born into. It's a period of social dislocation, of not being where you grew up and political unrest. But in the middle of that, okay, look in verse 28 again. I want you to see this of Luke chapter 1. The angel comes to her and says, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. He calls her a favored one. What we got to understand is Mary is the recipient of God's grace. She is not the giver of God's grace. Some people have taken this passage and they've distorted it and said that Mary is a giver of God's grace, that she's a giver of the favor of God, and they've elevated her to a status of almost God-likeness, and that's nowhere found in Scripture. The Greek says here that she is a receiver of God's favor, not a giver of God's favor. It's important that we understand that. There's only one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus, all right? He's the only giver of grace. Mary is just like you and I. She's a receiver of God's grace. But either way, this was a, this was a unique honor for a young peasant woman. And this greeting, it shocked her. Look at the next verse. It says, but she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. She says that, she's thinking that because she knows she's a poor peasant girl, and this is not a greeting reserved for poor peasant people. Then he says in verse 30, he says, you have found favor with God. God chooses the imperfect, but the available. God takes our ordinary and he turns it into extraordinary in his story. And the idea is this, what I want to get from this, this first takeaway is that God uses the imperfect, but the available. Mary was imperfect. She sinned just like you and I. She had to go through life just like you and I. She didn't get any special 
special attention or special um, uh, understanding or, or special favors from God. She just found favor in God's eyes. She went through life, same struggles you and I go through. But she was available. She was available. I think some of us were like, well, I don't know what God wants with my life. It might be that you're not available. Because God uses the imperfect. It doesn't matter how much you mess up. It doesn't matter what you struggle with in the past. It doesn't matter that you don't have enough money or you're not the most popular or you don't have the most stuff. What matters is, are you available? So why did God choose Mary? Not because she was wealthy or super important, because she was available. She was available for God. She was a faithful servant of God. And Mary was ordinary. There was nothing that really stood out about her. She was just going through life being faithful. And so this greeting shocked her being called favored, being told that she was chosen for this important task because this kind of greeting was reserved for people with money or people who were important. And she knew in her heart that she was just, well, she was just ordinary. And she knew that about herself. She wasn't popular. We're not told she was overly beautiful. We know she wasn't wealthy. She's just Mary. It's just ordinary, common, average, and yet when a faithful, ordinary person puts their life in God's hands, he takes the ordinary and he does the extraordinary. When an ordinary person, a faithful, ordinary person, puts our lives into God's hand, he takes the ordinary and he does the extraordinary. Why didn't God use somebody from Sephora, the wealthy town? Because more than likely there was nobody available. They're too comfortable. They have it all together, right? They don't need to be used by God. They're just going through life. They're... They got everything set. But here's this young peasant girl who's just being faithful, and she's available. And God's like, I have favor in you. I'm going to give you this amazing task of carrying the Messiah. Second thing this morning is this. Difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. Difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. You're like, where are you going with that? Here's what I mean by that. In our minds, here's what we do. We're like, okay, I, I think God wants me to do this task, or I think God wants me to say this, or I think God wants me to give this, or I think God wants me to do this thing. And the moment it gets difficult, you know what we do? It must not be God's will. Because surely God would not call me to do something that's not going to work out super easy, right? And, and we, we even put really spiritual terms on it like this. Well, God opened the door, and man, it just, he just paved the way, and it was easy, and so it had to be God's will. And the first time a roadblock, or the first time something hard comes up, we're like, well, it must not be God's will. Let me look for other doors. But that's not how God works. Church, listen to me. Difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. I can't tell you how many times I, I've counseled couples before and like, well, it must not be God's will for me to be with this person anymore because it's just too hard. It shouldn't be this hard to be married. It shouldn't be this hard to love somebody. That's not God's standard, <laughs> all right? Difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. And so think about the things that Mary, after this, a, this angel came to her and said, you're going to bear the Messiah. You're going to give birth to Emmanuel, We're like, oh, that's so cool. How awesome is that? But then we step back. Okay, what are the things she had to give up? What are the sacrifices? What are the roadblocks she had to come across that, what if she would have acted like we act the first time one of these roadblocks came up? Think about this. Now, this might not be a big deal to some of you, but it's a big deal to some others. She had to sacrifice the wedding of her dreams. Some of you are like, who cares? I, I get that, okay? But here's the deal. Weddings were just as big of a deal in that culture as they are today, if not more. Because our weddings are a one-day affair, right? One-day thing. You come, you have the big ceremony, you have the reception, the wedding's over. Their weddings, seven days. Seven days. Eating, rejoicing, celebrating, hanging out, dancing, singing, doing all the over the next day, more eating. So dads of daughters... You're like, man, i got to shell out money for a wedding. Hey, at least you don't have a seven-day wedding to plan for, okay? But now all of that's out the window. In fact, more than likely, her and Joseph probably, if, if, they, if they had an official ceremony at all, it was a private, just her and him because of the rejection that probably came about from that. Think about that. The, the next difficult circumstances she had to face was facing the rejection of her family. In that culture, look, and I know it's frowned upon even in our culture, it's like it's not a good thing to get pregnant out of wedlock, and it's not God's perfect plan. But in that culture, man, 
I said earlier, that could cost you your life. That could, that could cost you um, rejection. That could cost you being cast out of your family. I mean, think about this. Trying to explain to her parents, no, I'm pregnant. I get that. No, but an angel came and told me I was going to get pregnant. Oh, sure they did. Right. Yeah. They're not going to buy that. In fact, after this passage, if you, read, if you read the next few verses after verse 38, as soon as the angel comes to Mary, you know what she does? She leaves. And she goes and spends the next three months with Elizabeth, her husband, and, husband, and Zechariah. Why? There's only one of two explanations for that. Either one, her parents sent her away for her own safety because it's dangerous for her to stay there being pregnant. People aren't going to believe an angel came to her and said she's going to bear the Messiah. Or what's more likely is her parents rejected her and kicked her out. And Joseph, they weren't ready to make it an official wedding ceremony yet. And so where else is she going to go? She's going to be homeless. She went and lived with Elizabeth and Zechariah for three months. But imagine, for some of us, we're like, well, if I'm rejected by my family, that can't be God's will. Can't be God's will if I'm rejected by my family. What about this? Listen, the, the idea of having to travel in the last trimester of her pregnancy. And last trimester, probably the eighth or ninth month of her pregnancy. Now, for some of us, we're like, man, that's not a good idea. They, even doctors tell some, it's not a good idea to fly. The last couple months you're pregnant, don't do that. They didn't have an airplane to get on and fly from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which was 70 miles if you went in a straight line. They had to walk that thing. Now, imagine Mary, all right? She's pregnant, seven, eight, nine months pregnant. And here comes Joseph to her. Hey, Mary, um, there's this law that just came out. Like, I, we've got to go to Bethlehem because I've got to go register in the town I was born in for this census and pay my taxes. You know what, she, what some of us, and what maybe she even said, I ain't going, you go. Look, I'm not walking, all right? Like, I, we're not doing this, okay? Like, surely God, like, God would never do that. Surely God has enough common sense to say, I'm not going to make the woman carrying the Messiah, who's seven, eight, nine months pregnant, walk 70 to 90 miles to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, Right? And some of us would have been like, that's not, God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. But think about this. 70 miles, but they couldn't walk straight there. It was probably a 90-mile walk before they reached their place in Bethlehem. And I know the nativity scene and stuff, it kind of shows her on a, on a donkey. We don't know if, if Joseph had a donkey. The guy was out of work carpenter, and he had to go to Bethlehem and find money to eat on while he was there and pay his taxes. He might not have had a donkey. Even if he did, probably wasn't that pleasant of a ride, okay, for a lady in her trim- last trimester who's pregnant to ride a donkey for 70 to 90 miles. But they had to go make this. It's believed that they probably walked the 90 miles, which probably took them anywhere from four to seven days to a week and a half, depending on how many miles they were able to cover in a week. Talk about a di- difficult circumstance. Surely that can't be God's will. And then not just that, but then they get there. And she was probably thinking, I'm going to give birth to this Messiah. At least I get to do it in my own home. And, I, and like any other woman who's getting ready to have a baby, she's getting her home ready and, and getting everything perfected as much, even with the little resources they had to make that and to be able to rejoice and enjoy that new baby that's going to come into the world. And now she has to walk and go somewhere she doesn't know. That's Joseph's hometown. That's not her hometown. And she's got to walk this way to get there. She doesn't know anybody. And now find out she has to give birth in a stable. Surely that can't be God's will. That's dirty. It's, it's not what if she had in her mind how she envisioned this going down. And, we, and I know, I get it. The, the typical Christmas pageant, we get, you know, the, the kids are all dressed up in different characters. And you got a character playing Mary and Joseph and a doll for the baby. And they're, they're walking and you got little kids dressed up like sheep. And, and then they, they get to the inn and you have the grumpy old innkeeper comes out and like, no, we don't have any room. Sorry, go to the next place. And then might, if you have enough kids, you have to have parts for all of them. And maybe there's another innkeeper. and No, we don't have any room here. But hey, there's a barn out there. Go out there. And so we get that, that mental picture of this nativity scene. But I don't want to burst anybody's bubble this morning and destroy your whole vision of what that looked like, but that's not how that went down, okay? In fact, there's no innkeeper even mentioned in the Bible, okay? We, we get this from this, this word in, but it, it's that word that's translated in right here is kataluma. The Greek word is kataluma, which means guest room or upper room. It doesn't mean in. It doesn't mean hotel. 
Luke actually uses a word for hotel or a place you would stay or pay to stay when he talks about the Good Samaritan, and that Greek word is pandachion. That is, and so Luke very specifically uses the word kataluma. He's talking about a room, not a hotel or inn that you would go to pay to stay. Here's what more than likely happened. Joseph's going to his hometown, which means he has relatives in Bethlehem. He's probably too poor anyway to be able to afford a pension to stay in, a hotel to stay in. So he's going from house to house, a family member looking for a place that he and his young wife, who's pregnant, to stay, and she's about to be delivered. But word is travels fast then, just like it travels fast now. They didn't have to have Facebook or Instagram for word to travel. And his family members in Bethlehem know that Mary is pregnant, and it's not Joseph's. And they're probably not buying the story that the angel came and told them it's the Messiah either. So they're rejected in his own hometown, which is exactly what the prophecy said, that Jesus would be rejected from the very beginning. And he would be born an outcast. He would live his life as an outcast, and he would die as an outcast. So that everybody, outcast and people in the in crowd, could all have access to him. But this idea of Mary showing up in Bethlehem, difficult circumstance after difficult circumstance, now to look in the face of family members who now reject you. And you're about to give a baby, have a baby, and now they're like, well, there's a barn or a stable way over there. Why would they do that? Where's the compassion? We got to understand, have they allowed Joseph and Mary to come into their home and given them a guest room? And she delivered the baby there, their whole house would be considered unclean because that baby, in their mind, was, born, was conceived out of wedlock. And their whole house would have been unclean. And they didn't want anything to do with that. So, like, hey, go to the barn. It's already unclean anyway. Animals are living there. So go there. We would have looked at every circumstance that she had to go through and say, if this is God's will, there's no way it's this hard. There's no way it's this difficult. But I got, we got to understand this morning, difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. And there might be some things that God is calling you to do, calling you to give, calling you to sacrifice, calling you to say. And we're like, well, if it doesn't, if the door doesn't slam wide open and everything fit perfectly, it must not be God's will. That's not how God works. Mary had one roadblock after another, but she was still obedient. Which leads us to the next takeaway this morning. The last one is this. Number three, simple obedience can change the world. Simple obedience can change the world. Our simple obedience of speaking what we know we're supposed to speak, our simple obedience of sharing our faith, our simple obedience of inviting people to come in, our simple obedience of loving people like we love ourselves brings a thrill of hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. Simple obedience can change the world. Here's what Mary did. She wasn't perfect, but she just kept saying yes. She said yes to the angel. She said yes to God's plan. She said yes to traveling. She said yes to giving birth in a stable. She said yes to giving up her only son, the first son she had. She said yes to giving that to God or whatever God had. Look in verse 37. The angel gives her the message. In verse 37, here's what she says, or here's what the angel says. For nothing will be impossible with God. Look at her response. She said, I am the Lord's slave. I'm available. Yes. Yes. She says, I am the Lord's slave, says Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. And I, and I love that because this, that phrase, according, let it be done according to your word. In, in the Greek, that's the aorist middle tense, which basically means this. She is saying, what you are saying, I want done. God, your plan and your will, I am available. I want what you're saying, I want to have happen. I'm here and I'm available. She just kept saying yes. What an amazing faith this young girl displayed. She's not sinless, but she had great faith. God planned it and initiated it and Mary cooperated and said, I'm open and I'm available. We know the rest of the story and I don't want to spoil it because we're going to get there, right? But But she gave birth to Jesus that night in a stable. And the Bible says that the angels rejoiced. Because once again, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared. He was born. 
Emmanuel, God with us, not in the most glamorous of circumstances, not to some families from Sephora who had lots of money, not to the most popular, the most important, the most wealthy person, but he appeared. And the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and a glorious morning. Wow. The question this morning for all of us is this. Are you available? Are you available in this Christmas season? As we're going through this month, the easiest time of the year to share your faith. Are you available? Are you willing for God to take your ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary? Are you willing to put aside the doubts and the, hey, if it's difficult, it must not be God's will, and say, you know what, whatever happens, I know what God wants for me, and that's what we're going to do. And are you willing to allow just your simple obedience to change the world? Are you available? Church, let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Nobody looking around. It's a thrill of hope for us because for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ, it's a thrill of hope because we know that our hope is in the Messiah. And we know where our eternity lies. We know what the future holds, at least after this life. And it's exciting. It's a comfort. And it's hope. But you know, it's not a thrill of hope to those who are outside here who have never heard about it. And yeah, they might have heard about the Christmas story and the shepherds and the wise men and yeah, it's baby Jesus in a manger, but do they know the hope that is behind all of that? And we can hold on to that thrill of hope in here and make, man, we can rejoice in here, but what about the weary world that's outside these walls? Have we given them anything to rejoice about? Have we given them anything to say, yes, man, a new day is here. A new morning is coming. There is light into my life because I have introduced, been introduced to the Savior. See, it's not a thrill of hope if we just keep it inside. What matters is for those who have never heard, for those who have never accepted, what are we doing about that? Are we available? And some of us are just so content to go through an ordinary life and never watch God do something extraordinary with our ordinary. But it's possible for everybody that's here this morning. We just got to humble ourselves and say, God, yes. Yes. I'm broken. I'm not perfect, God, but yes. I have a lot of faults and failures, but God, yes. God, I know, man, I I struggle financially. I struggle in my marriage. I struggle in relationships. You know all my faults, God, but I want you to know, yes, I am available. And God, I want you to take my ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary for your glory. So church, where are you at? In just a moment, I'm gonna, the band's going to start singing here in just a moment. I'm going to invite everybody here in just a minute to stand, and we're going to worship Maybe this morning you need to say yes to God. Maybe this morning in your heart, maybe right there at your seat, or maybe you come forward, you just kneel or just in your own heart and say, God, I am available. I'm available. God can use Mary, a nobody from a nobody town, from a nobody county. God can use you. And God can use me. God wants to take our ordinary and turn it into extraordinary. Difficult circumstances do not dictate God's will. And obedience, simple obedience, can change the world. This morning, maybe you're here. Maybe you'd like to join the church. Maybe you need to, you'd like to be introduced to the Savior. I don't know where you're at this morning. But in just a moment when we stand, however God's impacted your heart, your life this morning, I'm going to invite you to respond. For those of you who went through our new members class, I'm going to invite you guys when we stand to come down here to the front and we're going to present you guys to the church when it's all over. But however God's dealt with your heart this morning, will you just respond to him? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Thank you that each and every word of the Bible, it's your word, you inspired it. It is infallible. It is perfect. 
And it's the source of our hope. And it's the source of our answers. And it's the source of our salvation. God, I pray for everybody here this morning. I know there's got to be somebody, people here this morning that maybe, that maybe they've made themselves unavailable to you. Maybe they think they're too big of a failure. I don't know. Maybe they're just, they're just wrapped up in other things. But God, this morning, I pray that you'll break some hearts for people to be available for you to use. God, maybe for some of us this morning that are using circumstances that are difficult to dictate whether we respond in obedience to you, I pray that you'll break down those walls of disobedience this morning. And they got our simple answer, our simple response out of our mouth this morning would be like Mary's, yes, I want your will in my life. God, help us to be a church over the next few weeks that invites people to come hear this thrill of hope and what it means. God, we love you. Thank you for meeting with us here this morning. We'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me this morning and worship?